Hello, multi musicians of Montreal. That's a malt mention, and thank you to Zeven Zacharian for that malt mention introducing because it's got an X, you see, so it's got to be an extras. 904 extras in which I, Ralphie, sitting in the bothy, kick back a little bit, make myself comfortable, and talk to you about casks. Not so much about the quality of casks and the size of casks and the different oaks that you can get in casks and the different flavours that uh, these, co these oaks have and exert an influence over the contents they're maturing, but specifically about the variety of previous content casks that are now being used like never before across the Scotch whisky industry and beyond. And it used to be not that long ago, back in the 1990s, that you got your stock matured single malts, where casks were really never mentioned, but people generally had an awareness that if it was Glenfiddich, it was an ex-bourbon cask matured whisky, and if it was Macallan, it was an ex-sherry cask matured whisky, and that for certain single malts like Macallan, excuse me, make myself more comfortable, and Glenfarclas, and Aberlour, and um, Glengoyne, another great example. Sherry casks just suited the whisky, so they were used pr predominantly, and you had that sherry casks, more savoury influence, with some deeper wood notes, complex wood notes, particularly back in the age where sherry casks were more inclined to be made from European oak, Cecile and Lamazan oak, rather than American oak, which they are now predominantly. Uh, and the reason's quite simple, it's economics. It's the economics of running a business, and that's the fact of it. And um, you have the bourbon casks, well, they were generic. There was, there was never in the early days in the 1990s any talk about, well, that's a Jack Daniels cask or that's a Jim Beam cask. Nobody, frankly, was interested. You had the light-coloured whisky and you had the dark-coloured whisky and the light-coloured whisky was for birthdays and the dark-coloured whisky was for Christmas in the new year. It was all oh, these simple times. <laughs> but then, Glen Morangy, always the innovators with their 16 men of teen. Now, of course, you call it the 16 people of teen or persons of teen. And um, they had an innovation which really got noticed by the, the industry. They had this cask matured range and they were specialising in finishing. So they'd start off in bourbon casks and then they'd finish in bourbon, sherry or port. And I distinctly remember the 12 year old portwood Glenmorangie. It was an excellent single malt. In fact, I remember just getting mildly pished on it at a sponsored event in Glasgow at a hotel in the conference suite um, where a famous writer was talking about his characters in the number one ladies detective agency series. Fantastic book. Oh, what's his name? Something, something Smith. I forget. Never mind. Just look up number one ladies detective agency books and you'll find out all about it. I've bought the books, I've read the books and I love the books. F beautifully written. Very colourful read. And um, we had free fisk. I mean, you know, obviously we bought tickets for the event and there was wee nibbles there. And Glenmorne, she had sponsored this, this book event because it's a bit more upmarket, you know, so they want to be applying the um, single malt stamp of endorsement. In the same way that I remember one of my first bottles of Bowmore came from um, the Aberdeen Strathspey and Real Society concert for a charity fund thing that was sponsored by Bowmore. And as the musicians, because I used to play the fiddle, I don't know if I remember mentioned this, I used to play the fiddle in a Strathspey 
in, in the folk music scene because it was relatively easy and, there's no, and if you made a few mistakes nobody bothered and I was never that interested in the, in the fiddle but I could fiddle along with everybody else and we had this concert, it went really well, great atmosphere, it's in Aberdeen and uh, we, if someone suddenly reached under the table and pulled out a bottle of Bowmore with a, oh, free whiskey! And of course everybody's <laughs> dropping the musical instruments, violins everywhere as they go and grab the bottle of whis free whiskey before anybody else gets it or thinks, well, maybe they don't drink whiskey so they've just left it, it was no point in going to waste so I'll grab it. <laughs> anyway, enough distractions. So in the early days you had the, the Portwoods and other, other producers thought, aha, if they're selling it, we better get some of these port casks. So you get a few ruby coloured whiskies, rose tinted whiskies coming along. Because when you, particularly in red port, ruby port, red port in particular, um, the colour comes out of the casks first and it comes out very quickly and in fact the influence of the the red fruit notes that you get in port will infuse into the whiskey quite quickly so after you've done it the real secret is to actually decant it back into an ex bourbon cask and just let it metal mellow down a little bit so if you ever come across these finishes which are a bit too overtly finished it means that they haven't had time to settle down and and re-racked into original casks just to round off so the presence can be a little bit harsh and you find this increasingly, particularly from more, less experienced distillers and whiskey makers. You can get a real kind of secondary influence shock of these casks. And also if it's too short term and superficial, it kind of tends to be sitting up front when you first taste the whiskey and after about 15 minutes it just seems to have disappeared and left the original whiskey behind it because the interaction has not been comprehensive. But after that, there was more experimentation with the occasional Madeira cask, but very rarely, and Marsala casks. And usually they'd be used, but not mentioned, and certainly no mention was made of, say, um, Tawny Port or White Port. And White Port influences whiskies magnificently. It really does. And but they were because there was not what the industry anticipated that the market would ex accept, and because the industry always goes in the assumption that they've got conservative palates and a conservative market of people who are reluctant to explore flavors, which goodness knows that's changing, it has been changing for a while and is still changing, and still some distillers seem to don't really quite connect with it. But you had the beginning of the arrival in the 2000s of secondary maturation. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. The original Aaron's, for example, didn't work at all. They had some dreadful versions until they completely rebooted the distillery and my goodness, isn't it transformed now? It just shows you, it just shows you what experience and focus can do for a distillery, any distillery. Understand this, malt mates, a really, really good distillery can make terrible whiskey if they're using poor quality casks and badly made spirit. But now is the age where particularly small distilleries, they realise that people are willing to explore and nobody knows this better than Bruch Lady when they started out and they wandered into the warehouses when the dream team took over and they discovered oh my goodness we don't we've got some really bad casks sitting here we need to get the whiskey out of them into new casks where can we buy them they're looking around good casks expensive kind of not relatively thin the ground, but you'd need to have the contacts for the good ones. So they were using wine casks, ex-wine casks. And many, many wine casks are made using really good quality wood. And it's not just oak. Um, you'll find that chestnuts used and cherry wood is used for making wine casks. And of course, this is a challenge for the distillers because 
I'm convinced, and this is just a personal opinion, that every now and again an ex-chestnut or an ex-cherry cask creeps in from the wine industry because they're not going to keep details of what's what. You know, if it looks like oak, hey, it's oak until we hear otherwise. You know, a certain amount is taken in trust. So a certain amount of, a small amount of whiskey out there, in my opinion, that's why I'm saying in my opinion, cover my ass here, has actually been matured in ex-chestnut casks. And in fact, is better for it. Because I don't know if you're aware, in fact, experienced malt mates, you'll notice, particularly with the big, big, big companies, the more the generic oak wood casks that they're using, the more it comes across and the result is that that oak thing, that standard cookie cutter oak thing that quickly makes you bored. Yeah, you know I'm right. You've experienced it, I've experienced it, we know it's out there. So, Brochlady really normalised to a certain extent with the anoraks and the whisky faithful buyers the eccentric use of diverse wine casks bringing a whole diversity of finishes meanwhile other distillers are looking on saying right get some tokai casks everybody's raving about tokai see the thing is it's association if you use a Chateau Margot cask for your whisky as Glen Morangy have done People are going to say, oh, that's a really good wine. We better buy that whiskey because that'll be a good whiskey. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter, malt mates, how good the previous content was in the cask. It's how that cask has been cared for and kept intact after it's been emptied and then transported to Scotland to be used for maturing whiskey. Is the cask rinsed out? Is it cleaned out? Does the cooper knock the barrel head off and give it a good scrubbing out inside? Is it acidity tested? Because see with wine, wine's 12 to 14%. In hot climates, in Spain, Italy, the alcohol is quickly going to get driven out and as soon as that happens, the bacteria will home in on the sugars that were in the wine and start to feed on them, creating acids which turn a cask rancid. So you need the casks ideally trans, trans, transported autumn, winter to spring, not midsummer. At which point they're nosed, checked. We're going to get eccentric results. Could be a white wine cask, red wine cask, rosy wine cask, champagne cask, Chateau de Cam, Australian wine, American wine casks. Um, what are they going to do to, to the to the whiskey, will will the single malt signature of our distillery actually lock in and match up with our, our wine casks? Far easier with bourbon, far easier with sherry. There's so much more experience with these casks. They're, they're tailor-made for whiskey. We know that. History's proven it. With 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 Madeira, Masala and Malaga casks, you've got that halfway house. And recently I matured a Glen Mor I'm not matured, I reviewed a Glen Morangy Malaga cask and it was fascinating. Brilliant whiskey? No. But it was just a cask curiosity that made it a really successful event for smell and taste. Same with this, what I've just reviewed in Ralphie Review 904. Uh, a 100% Madeira matured, light, Speyside Stroke Highland, Speyside Highland, single malt. I mean, I regard Glenmurray as East Highland, but some people lump it in with Speyside. Frankly, it's, it's what you call it a border. It's a border style, in my opinion. And it's worked beautifully well. It's still a simple whiskey, still definitively a Glenmurray. But that, Mal that Madeira cask has been a good cask, and it's just delivering a, 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 an honest, simple simple result which is just nice and refreshing because you don't want every whiskey every time to be a huge complicated tongue munching chore do you every now and again we want something that's just what it is and not too expensive and this is delivered and back to wine casks in particular more and more wine casks are being used with with scotch whiskey with variable results Wine can be quite 
ascetic. Shiraz is a good example. Riesling, for example, another good example. With these casks, they really need to be thoroughly rinsed out before they're used. But some distillers will just fill them to get the maximum wine influence to just, and just hopefully, fingers crossed, that over the years of maturation, the whiskey will just assimilate and mellow out and it'll be acceptable. And, you know, they're running a business. They don't have 40 hours in a day. They've only got 24 hours. So they've got to kind of cut a little bit of slack um, with their with their anorak mode. Uh, and if the whiskey doesn't really work out well, they could always sell it to the blenders or bottle it as their own blend because I'm going to make a prediction here. In the next few years, you're going to see a resurgence of the integrity blended whiskey, craft blended whiskies. Oops, excuse me, it's my tummy. Time for my dinner soon. I'm kind of going on a wee bit now, but I want to conclude by saying don't be afraid to buy Scotch single malt whiskies or even blended whiskies which have been matured partly or exclusively in wine casks. Sometimes, often they can work if the casks have been properly prepared by experienced industry professionals. Now and again, you're going to get some really eccentric stuff. For example, Peter Edredur, Balachan, in Burgundy casks, Bordeaux casks, you get some weird, weird results. Really weird. You, you'll sip a whiskey, you'll finish a whiskey of Balachan, and you'll ask yourself, did I actually enjoy that or not? And you're still not sure a few days later. It was just an experience. But don't be afraid of them, because it extends the range of your, of your engagement. It gives you increasing points of reference when you come to whiskey. And, and of course, the whiskey industry is going further. They're going into Eastern Europe, to Hungary, to Ukraine, for example. Um, the industry is using casks from Armenia, uh, Pernod Ricarda, as far as, as, far as I'm aware. Um, and Russia, you, Russia is a big winemaking country. And you increasingly have a big wine industry in Canada uh, because the, the craft and the science of cultivating grapevines is extending beyond the Mediterranean, way beyond the Mediterranean and, and mid-Europe mid now. It's heading north, it's heading east, it's heading south. You see Argentina, Chile for example, You've got varieties of grapes growing at really quite cold climates at high altitudes and doing really quite well. In fact, you've got a burgeoning wine industry, producing industry in England, producing some splendid white wines and a few decent red ones as well. And e even my latitude here in the Irish Sea, not far from the Irish Sea, you do have wineries. Because now the science is developing strains of grape, grapes that are cold tolerant and producing a different style of wine and these can be used for whiskies too. It's interesting times. Be prepared to explore but beware of bad versions. So do your research before you buy, before you try and just bear in mind you've watched a Ralphie video just generally talking about wine casks. I mean whatever next, cider casks, tequila casks, they, these all get explored and get considered simply because there comes a point where dis any distiller anywhere, they just want to get hold of a cask, any cask, because they need the casks, and casks are getting more and more expensive due to global demand. I'm Ralphie, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for watching. I'll be back very shortly with a bit of a, an announcement to make. So I hope you'll tune back in. Um, I've got some exciting news towards the end of the year, which I want to share with you. Um, a bit of an announcement as regards Ralphie's books, the books that I've been writing, but no spoilers. <laughs>